Your turn. I'm on you. <clears throat> All right. We are live on Facebook now. Um, want to welcome everybody to tonight's CWD live update. We're going to give uh, folks a few minutes to to come in, let the uh, number rise a little bit so folks don't miss it. And uh, as we're doing that, I just want to let everybody know that we will be accepting uh, questions in the comments, and we'll try to answer those as much as we can, best we can, and as fast as we can. If we miss you, I apologize. We will try to answer those in the chat if we uh, or in the comments if we don't get to them tonight. Uh, hey, Chris, and uh, hello, Steve. Thank you all for uh, tuning in. We've got a great panel tonight. Um, Mr. Chuck Yost, Dan Grove, Stephanie Carnes, and Jeremy Dennison will be with us tonight. They're on Zoom, so we'll bring them in in just a minute. But we're looking forward to uh, getting started tonight. All right. Um, we got 30 people on the line right now. Uh, Chuck, you want to kind of get started now, or do you want to give it a few more minutes? Uh, what, whatever your preference is is fine with me. All right. Well, it, the numbers the numbers rising, so we'll start with introductions. And uh, oh, uh, Paul, neighbors, thank you for sharing to uh, to a group. He's sharing this to another group, so give him a minute. So maybe there'll be some more people tune in a little bit later. Appreciate you doing that. Um, is CWD present anywhere in Tennessee? Yes, it is, and we will get to that tonight. I'll let you know. Give you a few updates on that. And hello, James. Thanks for tuning in in Waynesboro. Cool. Got some interaction tonight. We appreciate that. And uh, like I said, we'll try to get to all those uh, comments and, and questions. And if, if we don't answer them live, we'll try to answer them in the chat uh, tonight or as time allows. While we're waiting, uh, Chuck, how's your turkey season going? You having any luck this year? Yeah, yeah, it's been a, been a good season. The, the challenge is is to find the time to focus on it. But but yeah, yeah, I just my myself and my my family were feeding livestock just a minute ago and saw four gobblers just doing that. So, but yeah, yeah, it's been a good season so far. I've harvested one myself and and uh, should have harvested more. But I'll leave I'll leave those details for another time. Awesome. That's that's cool. Yeah. Um this season's going pretty well for me as well. We 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 uh harvested a bird and uh the the video's coming out on uh will be coming out on Facebook soon. We got it on camera, most of it anyway. Uh so check that out and then uh we went out hunting with Matt Dale from Dale Outdoors not long ago and and uh got on a bird with him. So you have to check those out when we post them on uh on social media. Wilson County's been good for turkey hunting. That's good to hear. And Larry, thanks for tuning in from uh, Knoxville. Yeah, we, we were doing the turkey project here in Middle Tennessee for the last three weekends as the different seasons in the different counties opened up and saw a lot of hunters coming through at, at various points in time. So we appreciate everybody who Brought turkeys by check stations in the in the research area down in south central Tennessee here because um, we were able to get a lot of good samples out of out of the critters for our our health project that we have going on. Yeah, that's very important. We appreciate those guys that'll stop by and let us take those samples. That's great. Well, uh, we're kind of holding steady around thirty, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Chuck, I uh, want to start out with you and let you introduce yourself. And then we'll go around the table, uh, let everybody introduce themselves, and then we'll jump into 
some of these topics for tonight. And uh, like I said, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll get to them. And uh, looking forward to it. So, Chuck, I'll turn it over to you for now. Yeah, well, good evening. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And, Jason, thanks to you and your crew for, for helping make this happen. And I'm, I'm delighted to be providing another update. I'm sure folks have been anxious to hear. We've, we've unfortunately are unable to, to be in person in the counties and have public meetings uh, like we had hoped to to provide these updates. But at the same time, very grateful that we can do it this way. So thanks, Jason and all for, for helping make that happen. And thanks to my colleagues that are joining me here or my other colleagues, but uh, we've got a, we got a great lineup uh, and I don't include myself as being uh, the great part, but I'm Chuck Yost, the chronic waste and disease coordinator uh, for the wildlife division of TWRA. All right, and we're going to move over to Dan. Uh, Dan, will you introduce, introduce yourself, please? Yep, I'm, my name is Dan Grove. I'm uh, officially a UT Extension employee. I'm based here out of Central Tennessee um, in the Central Region Extension Office, but I cover the whole state. I serve as the wildlife veterinarian for TWA in one part of my role. And then um, the extension part of my role, I serve as the wildlife health specialist for, for the state of Tennessee. Awesome. All right, now we're going to move to the prettiest one of the group, Miss Stephanie Carnes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jason. It's not hard when you're in a group of guys. <laughs> but hey, I did my best. <laughs> um, I'm Steph Durno Carnes. I am a, a wildlife health specialist for TWRA. Um, and I work with all wildlife diseases, but chronic wasting disease. Um, is what we're working on right now. Um, I've been working with CWD since the year 2000. So um, I'm a recent addition to TWRA and um, I'm really happy to be part of the team. Yeah, we're glad you're here. Thanks. All right, last but not least, Mr. Jeremy Dennison. Hey, yeah, I'm Jeremy Dennison. I work out of the uh, region one office in Jackson. I serve as the CWD field coordinator. Awesome. All right. Um, well, let's get started tonight with uh, with Chuck. Uh, you're going to give us a little update on the, the hunting season, harvest results, and a few things like that. So I'm going to let, let you go ahead and, and kick us off, if you don't mind, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, thanks. And just uh, uh, forewarn Jeremy there, I'd love it if he could tell us a little bit about that fine looking facility that he's he's in. And um, and yeah, I'd like to, to now provide a little update from, from deer season and and let you all know that we're we're gonna deviate from our usual format. In, in hopes of, of making this a little more engaging. We typically have a, a standard presentation we'd give to begin. And, uh, you know, that could, that could take up a fairly decent amount of time. And, 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 and we'd all have to wait a while for the, the question and answer. So to try to try something new, uh, we're gonna give very, I'm, I'm gonna give a really short uh, update and then we'll allow time to go ahead and address some questions or have conversation about it. And, and then the, the other uh, folks that are joining me will also give an, an, an update of a similar style. So that's gonna be kind of how we'll handle the rest of the evening with Jason doing his masterful work of, <laughs> of uh, coordinating the cats. And so here we, here we go. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna screen share here to uh, use some visual aids for, for just a moment here. Sure. So huge, huge success uh, this past deer season. You know, the season before, unfortunately, we experienced a decline in the, in the reported deer harvest. And uh, it was a big challenge for the agency and for hunters and all the affected stakeholders to try to increase that um, much needed harvest that we need to keep the disease from spreading. And I'm thrilled to report that there was great success in doing that. And I'd like to credit the hunters or landowners 
the other stakeholders, our partners, and and agency staff for their for their part in um, helping hunters accomplish that. So in unit CWD, we saw an overall 35% increase from the previous season. And as a quick comparison, I have the statewide um, result there. So it's a statewide minus unit CWD. We also saw a 16% increase statewide uh, minus unit CWD, which is good. And uh, but but man, that that outcome of a 35 percent increase was much needed and a, and a great reason to to celebrate. So uh, moving on, I wanted to re remind folks of what the changes were in the regulations leading up to that good result. Uh, we made all of the seasons except for the archery only season be gun muzzleloader and archery in unit CWD. Uh, we removed the limit on the number of earnabucks that could be earned. Uh, we added a har harvest incentive program uh, that encouraged folks to, to harvest even more. And then also there was a pandemic and we're, we're unsure what uh, level the pandemic influenced harvest, but it, you know, it, it, it had a difference. Not sure we'll know how much, uh, but it, it, it played a role and just thought I'd um, acknowledge that. It definitely so got people another, out there for sure. Yeah, yeah. So one other thing is the um, we we added a few counties to unit CWD, uh, but in all our comparisons, uh, we're making sure that we're we're comparing apples to apples in in what we report. So moving on, uh, now this is we're going to go back one season earlier here and 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 remind you of what these unfortunate results were. We had that decrease of overall 19%, but again, uh, we, we rebounded in a big way and had this past deer season that great 35% increase. So just to reemphasize that, that's excellent. So statewide, we did, a, we did a lot of sampling, a lot of testing of chronic wasting disease. And, and I'll remind you that we got a very strategic process or a strategy to that to our surveillance efforts and this is what we did just this past deer season and you'll see that that almost equated to 19,000 samples that's an all-time high for the agency and a great success for staff and thank you to the to the hunters that helped us accomplish that and when you look back at the three seasons where we've known to have CWD uh, we're up to over 1300 positive uh, CWD samples, and the, the vast majority of those come in from Fayette and Hardeman County, and that's because that's where the high prevalence is. Uh, the other counties have very low prevalence, so they only have a few uh, positives that have been detected. Now, you might, you might get the idea from, from that and from, from this graphic that shows the positive locations from all those seasons. Uh, that things are getting much worse and they they are not getting much worse uh, or, or at least th these aren't reasons to feel that way. CWD is a slow moving disease and unfortunately we believe that we detected it maybe even a decade later uh, than it was introduced into our state and it's still, un it's still unclear uh, how chronic waste disease was brought to Tennessee but obviously it's here. And, uh, and, and very prevalent in some areas. But in uh, one, one more reminder, I, I use the same graphics most of the time, so folks are familiar with them. But in this case, uh, you'll see the, the, the purple uh, circles, I call them, even though that's not exactly what they are. Those represent a radius around uh, the outermost positives. So sometimes we refer to those as spark areas, but those, so, so those outermost um, positive deer that were detected away from the core area of Fayette and Hardman County. There's a 10 mile radius around those, which affects the county because what it results in is if it's, if it's not a positive county, but yet we detect the disease within 10 miles, then it's uh, classified as a high risk county. And the most recent change that we had in those classifications of, of counties was adding Henderson County, which is now considered high risk. 
So Jason, that, that concludes what I was prepared to present. So I'll stop there uh, to allow conversation to happen. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Not a lot of questions coming in right now, uh, but I will say, I think uh, not to pat myself on the back or, or anybody like that, but just our, our communications division and, and, and Amy out there in uh, region one doing a lot of good work, you know, communicating about CWD and, and getting the information out. I'd say that's probably why some of those numbers have increased, just the, the knowledge about what it is and, and how hunters can help and, and all that kind of stuff. I think communications has done well to, to get that information out. So that's, that's probably why some of those numbers have gone up. I'll say that. How's that sound, Chuck? Well, there's no <laughs> doubt in my mind that, that the agency's uh, communications and outreach are a huge part of uh, our success. Yes, sir. Absolutely. All right. Um, yeah. So not really a question, but uh, a comment has come in. You want to take one? Um, sure. Humic acid has been shown to remove prions in the soil. Have you all looked into this? I guess it is a question. I didn't read far enough. I'd say, is that, is that a Dan question? I would say it is. <laughs> yeah, there's there's been one study that was, uh, it was actually done in, in the laboratory, uh, wasn't done actually out in real world conditions. Uh, we do know that prions are broken down by certain acids and certain bases and um, there is some evidence that humic acid, which normally occurs in kind of uh, swampy type areas, um, you know, where there's a higher moisture content, there is some evidence that uh, it inactivates prions. Uh, it's not necessarily a surprising finding, um, just given what we know about prions being proteins and the influence of acids on, on the actual chemical structure. Uh, the real world applications of that though um, have yet to be, be shown. There are people that are looking into that as well as a host of other um, chemical compounds that might be able to help denature the prions in the environment. Uh, but at this point in time, the true role of what humic acid may or may not play, um, it's not very well understood outside of the laboratory type setting. So. When you start getting and trying to apply things in the real world where you start having all kinds of different influences from weather to climate to rainfall, snowfall, things like that, it starts to impact kind of those those kind of chemical processes that are actually occurring out there in the environment. But, you know, it could be why you don't see too much CWD in swampy areas. You know, you, you see it in areas where there's less humic acid and things. So, but then again, that's just conjecture. Um, you know, there's not anything showing one way or another that there are positive or negative impacts um, for having humic acid and high content in, in, a, in a particular area. Okay. All right. Um, more questions coming in. So let's, let's hit some of these. Uh, Logan asked, uh, he has three questions here. First one is, is there a predictive model suggesting the rate of CW, suggesting the rate CWD will spread to new counties? Um, we're actually working with a much larger project uh, we were going to talk about later, but I'll talk about it now. Sure. Uh, it's, it's called, it's, it's we, short, the short version of it is we're working with Cornell um, and about 15 other states where we're combining our data sets. Um, one of the components of that project, the overall project is called the SOP for CWD. Um, and um, basically, we're trying to utilize all the data from the Eastern states that are dealing with the disease in white-tailed deer to develop one predictive models of spread of the disease, uh, predictive models of impact on the population, um, predictive models of where to find the disease potentially if it has moved to a new area and you're unaware of it. Um, much like we have our surveillance system, um, we developed that in conjunction with Cornell. So one of the things we're doing actually through that project is tweaking our surveillance system and improving it by using data uh, from all these other states to kind of input into that. So yeah, we're, we're looking at that. We don't have, um, it's not up and running and live yet. We're kind of in the beta testing phase for various components of that project. Um, but at some point in time, hopefully within the next couple of years, we'll kind of have that. But again, it's like anything, we're trying to predict what animals are going to do on the landscape because really, you know, we, we know human movement of the disease, but what we can't really predict 
hundred percent is what an animal is going to do, especially if it starts to become ill. Um, so these are going to be kind of uh, best guess predictive models. Um, but, uh, you know, it'll help inform management and where we may target or not target management in the future. Um, again, models are only as good as the data we put it into them. So that's why we're trying to combine from so many different states is to kind of build that data set and make it a, a stronger model. Okay. Good question. Yeah, good question. The next one was, um, and we probably should have had someone here from, from law enforcement for some of these, but uh, maybe Jeremy, since these boots on the ground there in that region can answer, is there an increase in LEO, LEO uh, presence from TWRA and the CWD areas to ensure compliance with the CWD regulations? Yeah, I'm, I'm like you, Jason. I wish we had a law enforcement, um, some law enforcement personnel uh, on the on the call with us. But I mean, to my knowledge, they're they're def that's definitely something that they're they're putting more emphasis in. I don't know anything specific about you know numbers of violations and in, in uh, unit CWD versus other parts of the state. But I do know it's something that um, you know has been alluded to. Something that's really important. Uh, we factor in, you know, how humans could potentially spread it. So it's definitely something that's that's on their radar. Sure. Okay. The next one was about number of tickets written, and we wouldn't know that uh, as it pertains to illegal baiting and feeding in that CWD area, unless you know hey, some Jason. numbers. Go ahead, Chuck. Yeah, if I may, I, d I just wanted to say that, you know, the, the, the regulations uh, around CWD management for example, the, the the carcass movement restrictions, the wildlife feeding restrictions, and then the, the bag limits and season dates and such for unit CWD, you know, that the wildlife officers play such a crucial role in, in the enforcement of those, which, you know, in hand, that 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 helps us be effective in meeting our goals for, for CWD. And and then also another major area where where they're supporting the CWD efforts are we have a CWD management permit that landowners depending on the location of their property in unit CWD they may be eligible for a permit that allows some additional take uh, from what's uh, taken during during deer season and our wildlife officers help administer that program too so they they you know they're 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 a key part of of the program success as well awesome all right thanks for that input chuck that's good i, I think we'll take a few more questions since they're then since they're coming in uh james asked what do y'all do or what do you do if you get a deer with cwd and how could you tell somebody wants to take that one Go ahead, Jeremy. <laughs> I can, I can it, uh, not really a way to tell, um, other than a deer that's in the you know the final stages of you know clinical disease. Um, so we'd recommend you know that if you harvest deer in unit CWD, you have your deer tested um, and follow the CDC recommendations on consuming them. But I mean, as far as you know, the number of positives that we've detected to date, the vast majority of those have been otherwise you know healthy looking healthy appearing deer that you know look perfectly normal uh, so unfortunately there's not a there's not a good field test or a good good way to screen the positives from from the others so yep and and even if an animal does look like it has cwd without actually testing it we wouldn't know if it had it or not because the, the visual signs of cwd it could be any any one of 10 to 15 different diseases if it's in the later stages of it. Unfortunately, it's a long progression of the disease. So they're, you know, what we call clinically normal. They act normal for quite a long time before you actually start to see any of those sort of changes. Yeah, and what, what a great opportunity to plug the sick deer reporting system that we have on our <laughs> website. So if, if you do find yourself with that question, of uh, you see a, a deer that are, that appears ill, then we do encourage uh, reporting those, and and you know the results of those go a long ways in helping inform uh, what we know about where the disease is, and that that that, that helps us make better management decisions. I'd, I'd add to that, and also encourage people if you see a you know if you see a deer, please take advantage of that uh, sick deer reporting program. Um, I'll just add, you know, one of the 
one of the spark areas that we've that we've managed that we've you know put special emphasis on. Um, that detection was actually the result of two different people that utilized that sick deer reporting system. So, um, and it's in an area that we otherwise we probably wouldn't we wouldn't know about the disease based on where it was located. Um, so it, it has had positive results, um, in, you know, and are being able to to track the disease. So I'd encourage folks to continue. Yeah, awesome. That couldn't have been more timely. Steve had a question about, you know, how to, uh, if they see something like that, how to, and should I take a picture or should I do a, make a phone call? So that's that's the answer. You should do the report of sick deer. Uh, that's the best way to to submit sightings and things and and. If you think a deer might be sick or might have CWD, that's the best way to do it. And you and there is a way to, to put pictures through that system also. So it is really helpful to have those photos and things um, if people have them, if they take them. It's, since it is all internet based, it, it is pretty easy to upload that kind of information or videos or things like that also. Yeah. Be yeah and other other than CWD, it gives us a it gives us a pretty good idea um, on a regional basis about uh, other other things going on with deer, like reports of EHD, you know, a lot of, especially if we have pictures and good descriptions um, of where the animal is located and kind of the condition, then we can have kind of a good indication of, you know, areas where EHD is maybe having a, an effect. I'm sorry. All right. Yeah, for sure. And um, let's jump on. That information, if they, um, if somebody right. is, concerned about a deer, it's real simple. Just Google TWRA, report a sick deer. You go through the steps. The website is really easy to do. The information goes to local staff and they respond immediately. Um, so um, don't think it's going to a black hole. Um, it's, some, it's information that we really value um, from a lot of perspectives. So be proactive. It's really helpful. I don't know if we mentioned CWD in Tennessee. That's where you can find that button. So um uh, visit it and check it out uh let's see one more question and we'll move on to some other things cwd was first discovered in in mule deer in colorado in 1967 uh since there hasn't been evidence of humans being infected i'm not understanding the concern uh deer being tested have been shot by us hunters anybody want to comment on that it's not really a question but i thought it was worth mentioning so um, I'll just take a, a quick stab at it. Sure. Um, chronic wasting disease is um, a disease that is, um, it's one of several different diseases that are called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. Say that seven times twice. Wow. <laughs> um, and it, it, there are different diseases that are similar to it. They're caused by misfolded prions, misfolded proteins called prions. Um, and there are different diseases that do um, cross over the species barrier into humans. Um, it's similar to chronic wasting disease is similar to mad cow disease in, in bovines. And that has been shown to um, be transmissible to humans. Um, it's also similar to the prion disease scrapie and then a naturally occurring human disease um, variant of prions. So there is the potential or prions to infect humans. Um, and because it's always fatal, caution is the best choice. And so since you can't prove a negative, we need to err on the side of caution. And that's why the CDC recommends um, being careful in how you handle animals and also um, that you don't consume any meat that you know is infected with CWD. Thanks, Steph. Uh, um... I think this is worth mentioning and, and worth touching on, and it in especially in CWD units. Uh, they're talking about baiting here. Brian asks or mentions that Texas has one of the largest deer herds, and they allow baiting. Uh, but most states around Tennessee, and most states around Tennessee, allow it as well. He doesn't understand uh, how the, it's not allowed to bait in Tennessee now, other than maybe the revenue that it brings in for tickets. But it's very important that baiting isn't done in CWD because uh, CWD areas because of the congregation of deer, right? Can exactly. Lead to the spread. The, yeah. Yeah, that's right. You know, there's, there's very limited management options for CWD 
and and one of those is just simply to to do what you can to limit congregation so uh, you know but obviously uh, feeding feeding would do that so that's that's the rationale of why to not do it in a CWD area. All Just right. like at the yeah. beginning of the school year, when you get a bunch of kids go to the kindergarten classroom, everybody gets sick and then they pass it around to them, each other and then they take it home and they pass it around. It's the same thing with CWD. When you concentrate everybody in a single area, you just spread them into disease more quickly. Yeah. All right. I think now is a good time to uh, pass it over to Jeremy because the question came in about uh, – a new CWD testing lab. Did TWRA get a new CWD testing lab set up in Tennessee last year? And we do. We have a nice lab there behind you, Jeremy. Well, to, to be clear, this is this is more of a sampling facility. Uh, we do we do have a testing lab that is set up in Tennessee with the Department of Agriculture in Nashville at Cord Lab. Um, where I'm at on location is uh, in Jackson. It's our... Um, our CWD sampling facility for, for region one. Um, basically when we first detected CWD, um, of course we didn't have a facility to do the type of work that, that is required. Um, we were able to utilize some borrowed space from a processor and that worked really well to get us going. Um, it became pretty clear that we needed a bigger space. Um, and then when you throw in, uh, COVID-19 and all the protocols and recommendations as far as uh, social distancing. Um, but anyways, we're, we're very blessed and very happy to have uh, this lease facility here in Jackson. Um, this is where if you get a, if you have a deer sampled in region one, um, whether it's at a check station on one of the opening weekends or you utilize uh, one of our sample collection uh, locations, then it comes through these doors. Uh, whether that's, you know, actually pulling the samples on the tables behind me, um, they're sorted, their uh, data entry happens here, they're shipped from here. Um, so this is kind of where the hub where everything, uh, where everything happens. Great. And thanks for clarifying my question there. Sometimes I get testing and sampling uh, mixed up and that's easy to do. But yeah, a great facility and, and definitely needed for the work that's going on there. For sure. Uh, would someone want to touch on the possible uh, the the availability of testing in Tennessee in the future? In terms of like, I guess, could you would you, would you be a little more descriptive? In well, the question, I guess the question was about a testing facility. So, is there will there be a testing facility in Tennessee at some point? You think, hopefully, down the road. Well, I mean, Cord Lab is set up to do the diagnostics. Okay. Um, are, 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 I guess is the question getting at for hunters to submit directly, or it's not. It's it's not sp oh. sp specific. No. Okay. Yeah, and and right now, um, there there is another lab looking to get set up in the eastern part of the state associated with the vet school. Okay. Um, so we might have two labs that can actually do the diagnostic work. Part of the problem with getting a lab set up is there's a lot of, because prion diseases are potentially infectious to people, there's a lot of controls and regulations that occur. And so typically it's gonna be labs that are accredited by the USDA. Um, and there's not necessarily one in every county, you know, like here in the state, I think we only have the two. Um, and so it, it takes a little bit of time to get those things set up and a lot of money. All right, cool. Well, let's let's move through some of these other presentations. I know you guys had some stuff kind of set out to present and talk about. Uh, Stephanie, let's let's jump to you if you don't mind. All right, sounds good. Um, I'm just going to jump through some of the um, management strategies and also a little bit of new research that we're working on. Um, and uh, it's going to take me just a sec to share my screen, um, but generally. Um, we have a really broad approach to how we're managing the disease, um, both through regulations, through research, and also through management actions and monitoring. And so I'm going to hit some of those. Um, let's see. Hopefully you should be able to see my screen now. Any luck? It is 
there. It's probably the wrong screen, though. It looks like it's the uh, uh, trial. The okay. It wasn't in presentation. Rookie. There we go. I grabbed the wrong one. Sorry about that, guys. I'm That's glad right. I checked. Okay. Um, so the go. first one of the strategies um, that I'll touch on briefly is targeted removal. Um, and this is a program that we started just this, this year. Um, we started the end of deer season and went through the end of March. The intention of this program is to first get very, very focused surveillance information from areas around um, air, novel positives. So um, positives that are more than 10 miles from the nearest other positive. Those areas here on the screen that you can see are highlighted in blue. And um, those are um, positives from the last three years since that are more than 10 miles away from the nearest other positive. And the intent of the program is um, within a three mile radius of those new positives is to reduce densities and remove animals. That gives us a surgical strike and really good precision to see what the disease is doing in that area try and get an idea of how prevalent the disease is, how widespread it is, really understand what's going on. In addition to that, it has the additional benefit of decreasing density, which can decrease um, both prevalence in that area and also spread. Now this, it may seem like um, a little worrisome. People tend to look at that and say, is this an eradication? That's not the intention at all. Um, it is really intentionally to get a better concept of what the disease is doing in that new area um, and also to reduce the density. Um, it is a partnership with private landowners. We're only doing this on lands that we have permission on with landowners that are willingly interested in participating to help CWD management. Um, through this targeted removal through those two and a half months, um, we were able to um, remove about 100 deer from the landscape over those five areas. The great benefit is that we did donate 4,000 pounds of deer meat because we didn't have a single positive in those areas. So we got a lot of information. One is that in those areas that represent the leading edge of the disease in Tennessee, we did not find additional positives. So we can see that the prevalence is low in those areas. So this was really useful information. Um, we will continue doing that as we get a better snapshot of the disease and go forward with that, that program. Um, but the good news is, is we didn't detect any new CWD in those new areas. That is good Another, news. Um, we're going a little slow. My computer is very thoughtful. <laughs> Another management program that we just started is um, density monitoring. And this is happening across the entire area affected by CWD. What we're doing, this is the, again, the first year of this long-term monitoring project. And um, from here on out annually, we will be measuring density um, in eight different areas across the CWD affected area through aerial flights um, using infrared imagery. So we um, have four areas that are in the CWD, kind of the core area where we have the highest prevalence. And then four of the areas are in those peripheral areas where we did the targeted removal. So this has um, the benefit of um, monitoring the impact of chronic wasting disease on density in these areas, especially in the core area where the prevalence is high. Also, we can look at the, diff the um, relationship of density and the disease in those areas where the prevalence is very low in those peripheral areas. Um, we will compare those densities over time within the specific areas and look at the changes in density as related to prevalence and spread. So it's incredibly valuable information because it's a, going to be a long-term monitoring tool that will really allow us to document and learn from the disease. Um, and it will also give us the added benefit as we move forward with targeted removal of seeing what, um, what that management prescription how that impacts um, density estimates. So um, it's a really exciting project. This is the first year and we'll be using these data long-term to inform our management strategies. Now, the, the really fun thing that I get to share with you all is about a new research project that also started this year. 
Um, this is a partnership with Colorado State University and the National Wildlife Research Center. It's funded by USDA. Um, and the intent, it sounds very technical, is the CWD canine biosensor project. But really what we're doing is in collaboration, training dogs to detect the byproducts of chronic wasting disease infection. And um, there's no way to smell a prion. So that's not actually what we're doing. We're, um, they're working to train the dogs to smell the changes in the animal's body and therefore in the feces from the impacts of the disease. Now, um, when I say we, it's sort of that royal we, the work is actually being done um, at CSU, Colorado State University. They've had great success with other diseases, particularly avian influenza and being able to detect avian influenza in the field with waterfowl, um, hunter harvested waterfowl specifically. Um, so we're doing the field trials here in Tennessee um, and there's incredibly useful applications for this long-term. It could be used as a presumptive field test for harvested deer might give folks an indication whether they should process that animal or, um, or if it could possibly, if it's more likely that it's um, infected. It may be, we may be able to use the dogs to detect any kind of environmental contamination because the prions do persist in the environment. Um, that could help us with management strategies in the future. Um, and it could help us focus those targeted removals. So we really are doing that even more targeted, more focused surgical strike to remove deer. Um, it's, it has great potential. We're really excited about it. Um, and we're doing the field trial trials um, here in Tennessee. So I'm actually going to kick it over to uh, Jeremy Dennison, kick it back to him because he's been on the ground with those dogs um, watching them work. So I'll kick it over to Jeremy. Thanks, Steph. Uh, yeah, it's been pretty remarkable to see um... You know, we've heard reports about the dogs being, you know, going through the going through the paces for, you know, to learn that procedure in a lab setting. Um, and we're told that they were about 80, 85, 86 percent as far as being able to detect, um, you know, positive or not detected samples uh, from the from the feces. Um, and so they like like Steph said, they've been they've been here this week. We're working on a on a parking lot up uh, around the regional office um, in an area where they can be introduced to different different smells and you know noise and birds and all the different things um, and they they've done really well there I think about 70 percent is their accuracy initially um, and, but it's again it's still ongoing and the plan is to to move the rest of the week to a more higher prevalence area uh, where they'll have that you know that uh, you know, outside outside noise and, and and other stimuli, as well as you know the potential for um, prion material on the landscape. So, very interesting. Um, we've had a lot of it, it's been a good week. You know, watching them work. So, very I was very impressed. That's cool. I think that'd be fun to watch those dogs. Uh, um, if you don't care, Jeremy, can we jump back to a question and then we'll come back and let you finish out some of the things you had had planned for us. Sure. Uh, this is a targeted removal question. Uh, are any deer being removed from public land? And if so, uh, how are they targeted? Uh, how are the targeted removal numbers in those areas? Um, um, yes. Oh, go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead, Jeremy. Go for it. I was going to say, uh, towards the end of the um, targeted removal uh, program, um, we did begin to operate in an area of public land uh, in Lauderdale County. Um, uh, there, wasn't, there was a few deer taken off of it, but those density estimates that Steph uh, described is really gonna guide us uh, in the future to be able to, you know, to know what effect we're having on that local population, as well as potentially taking off additional positive animals. Cool, okay. Yeah, and Jeremy, if you wanna jump into the other things you have planned for tonight, I think that'd be a good time to do it. Yeah, let me share my screen real quick. I started talking a little bit about the sampling facility um, here in Jackson, where, where I'm at on location. Um, and just remind people that there's plenty of locations where you can get your animal tested if you hunt in unit CWD or one of the 
joining counties really um, we've got about 75 different locations uh, and those are listed on this map there's also a map and a lot of this information on our website uh, all those locations from the past couple of years are the same and we'll have additional locations in Henderson County um, this coming up season uh, as Chuck said you know Henderson County was is now classified as a CWD high risk. So we're anticipating more interest um, folks in that county uh, for getting their deer sampled and tested. So uh, we're gonna make that available, you know, as efficiently as, as we can. Um, another thing that I had, uh, it's already been mentioned, but the CWD management permits, uh, those are available to owners. Uh, and about 240 of those were issued. Uh, most of those were in Fayette and Hardeman counties. And another, you know, our, our law enforcement personnel were, were you know, uh, kind of the front lines in issuing those, those permits. And we appreciate, we appreciate that. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't require additional sampling uh, in Fayette and Hardeman counties uh, as part of that program. Uh, we did. We did specify that we wanted the, the animals to be sampled in the in the buffer counties and the counties around those two. Um, we did have a few, maybe you know, it was less than ten uh, in uh, Madison County, and I believe there's a couple in Lauderdale. Um, early reports that um, wasn't a ton of deer killed in Fayette and Hardeman County, but those reports are still coming in, so we'll know more about the actual numbers that were. Um, that were taken uh, as we get the rest of that information in. So we hope to hope to have a full you know look about um, how many additional animals were taken. Um, I think that's about all I had, Jason. Okay, cool, good stuff. Uh, last but not least, Dan, I know you touched on SOP uh, for CWD. What else did you have for us tonight? Anything you wanted to touch on? <laughs> Yeah, we'll finish off with some of the depressing stuff, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see here if I do this correctly. You guys are seeing that. It's coming. There we go. Yeah. So um, basically, uh, you know, I just wanted to at least tell people some of the numbers from some of the things that we found um, over the last three years. This is the prevalence um, by county within the affected unit this year. Um, and that's that's showing up at this point, right, Jason? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. Just just making sure because my my internet tends to get bogged down here. Um, anyways, you know when we when we right now um, we're only getting prevalence at the county level because all of our non-detect locations, we don't have the, the specific location of all of our non-detects. We do find out where each positive was harvested. So to kind of really focus in on a finer scale, um, we're working on ways to try and get those non-detect locations. So keep in mind, it's size matters. And, you know, so, you know, I'll show you a map a little bit later uh, to kind of explain why I, why I bring this up. Um, to start off with, you know, back up a little bit prevalence when we're talking about it. Uh, it's basically the number of animals. If I went out and randomly sampled 100 animals on a landscape, how many of them would have the disease at, at a very given point in time? And so for us, the way we calculate prevalence is the number of positives divided by the total number of animals sampled, and that gives you a prevalence rate. And we use that as to, to monitor over time um, any increases or decreases, and you know whether harvest regulations are impacting or, or not. Um, sorry, this is moving. But anyways, so this kind of gives you an idea. We've got higher prevalences in Fayette Hardin County and very low, less than one percent prevalence in our peripheral counties. And where that comes into play more so is at the management level. Um, you know, once you get above certain prevalences, it's really hard to kind of go in and do like this, as Stephanie said, the surgical strikes, right? Uh, we can still achieve that in our periphery and potentially keep the disease from spreading outside of those counties. Um, within Fayette and Hardeman, it's gonna it's gonna require a little bit more work to try and 
keep those prevalences from, from increasing each year. Um, this is the combined data from both Bay and Hardeman for the last three years. And so we are seeing an increase in prevalence in those counties each year. And that is a statistically significant, if we want to get into the nuts and bolts of it, that is an actual increase. It's not relative to the numbers of animal sample or anything like that. It's actually a, a true increase in the prevalence that's occurring each year in Fayette and Hardeman counties. Hey, uh, this hey, Dan. Like, hey, Dan. Hey, Dan. Yeah. Your audio is a little, little weird tonight, um, but uh, keep trying there. We might have to have you not, not share the slide so it comes through a little clear. That might be messing okay. with your audio. I, I moved my computer around. Is it any better? Uh, go ahead, and we'll see. Okay. Um, so basically, when we look at again both Fay and Hardman data can combined. Um, we have detected in the way we measure our ages, we've detected the disease in every age in sex class that we look at. Um, and there have been increases in, in all of those classes over the course of the last three years. Um, and I say three years, but the reality is we're looking at a 26 month sampling period so far, because really this is since December of 2018. Um, so if you kind of do your math and track forward, we're, we're really only a little over two years into since we've had our first detection. Um, I broke out just specifically the Fed County since Fed County's got the highest prevalences. Um, if you actually look at it countywide, um, you know, if we look at our adult buck prevalence that being two and a half years or older, if I went out and randomly harvested 100 bucks, 21 of those would be positive, and that's countywide. That's a pretty high prevalence in a buck population. Um, and so if you look at the others, it's kind of, you know, what you would expect to see at this point. Um, again, it's higher in our adult does and in our yearling age classes. Um, but again, prevalences are, are increasing each year. I'm kind of giving you an idea. This is kind of a heat map. So the darker yellows and reds, there's been more positives detected there. We haven't updated this with this last year's totals. Um, so this is just through the end of uh, the 2019-2020 season. Um, within this core area, as we call it, uh, you're going to have a much higher prevalence if you're harvesting animals in this core area, as opposed to if you harvest it further out, um, like on the border of Shelby County or McNary County or, or even up towards Madison. But if you're harvesting there on, in that area, those prevalences that we're reporting at the county level are kind of being diluted. Um, relative to what your prevalence might actually be with the missile sets at this point. Um, we talked about that, but we'll talk about that anymore. And that's all I have. Jason, why don't you, why don't you take some questions or, or, yeah, give Dan an opportunity to maybe uh, work on his coverage there. Yeah, that's uh, got some funky audio, but that's okay. I, we were hearing most of it, and I think it was uh, it was clear uh, what you were talking about there. So I appreciate, appreciate that update. Um, I didn't have any more questions, uh, I don't think. Well, there was one one more. Uh, is there any progress on a, uh, the development of a quick test for CWD? No, at this point in time, there's not. Uh, it's just the nature of prions. Um, you know, if there was going to be a quick test developed, the money has been being dumped in on our um, agricultural commodities, so basically the cattle side of things, and there's not even a quick test for cattle at this point in time. I don't see one within the next decade, according to the folks that develop these tests, um, they wouldn't anticipate uh, an actual reliable quick test. Quick being within 24 hours kind of deal. Well, animal side tests, you know, the closest thing we'll get is probably the dogs at this point in time, um, should they prove successful. Uh, but like at this point in time, everybody that's telling us anything that knows anything about developing these tests, it's we're at least a decade or more out for having a rapid test on this. All right. Well, thanks for that, Dan. I think, uh, I think you're, when you screen share, that's what messes with your audio. Cause that was clear. That was good. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I'm in a rural County, so <laughs> I'll blame my internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Let's see. Oh, one more question just came in, and we'll we'll throw this one out there, and then we might wrap it up for tonight. If y'all have, don't have anything else, uh, thank you, Steve. Question is: You are showing 
you were showing where the hot spot is in West Tennessee. What about the rest of the state? I know there was a there uh, there is CWD on the Virginia West Virginia border. Is there anything encroaching in other areas, and should we be aware that we should, we should be aware of? Uh, Let me uh, in terms of the, the the way we. What's that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a I'll take a stab at that first. That one, and I and I want to start by emphasizing that you know we focus so much on the what we call the core zone or Hardeman and Fayette County where the prevalence is the highest, and we do that naturally because that's where we're finding the most disease and the prevalence there is is very concerning and and very challenging to manage. So uh, that's important, but. But we can't forget, and we need to emphasize more the importance of, of of fighting the disease on the periphery in those low prevalence counties. So, although you know the map's not real concentrated as far as the number of positives, those areas on the outer edges are are the most significant to to uh, prevent the spread. So, I want, wanted to to point that out. As far as um, CWD and border states, yeah, many of our border states uh, have it now. The only state where I, 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 uh, I'm confident we share this issue is with Mississippi, and and I believe that they've got you know a similar uh, issue than we do, right there, just south of of Hardeman and Fayette counties in Tennessee, in um, in Mississippi. So, uh, we're 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 in, constantly communicating with them to to compare notes and make sure we're making uh, wise decisions and aligning our management as much as we as much as our states will allow on the uh, Arkansas and Missouri end you know the disease is 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 farther away as far as we know uh, they're not tied as far as the distribution with Tennessee so that's kind of my my overall uh, response for that. And Dan, I'm sorry to have stepped on you. If you'd like to contribute, that'd be great. Yeah, I was just going to say, we, we do state sur statewide surveillance every year, and we have since 2018. Um, we instituted a new surveillance program that's set at the county level. So we have quotas for every county. And since that uh, was instituted, um, we, for the last three years, we've actually reached our county goals and and actually exceeded our county goals pretty much in, in every county um, throughout the state. So all 95 counties within the state of Tennessee have had a full three rounds of surveillance done. Um, if the disease does exist somewhere else in the state, it's below our detectable levels. In general, um, outside of our CWD zone, our detectable level is set at uh, greater than or, or uh, equal to 0.5% prevalence. So if it existed at that, we would be able to detect it. Um, whenever you get closer to the CWD zone, it's like 0.1% prevalence is what we've set our detection rate at. Um, in terms of Virginia, you know, we've got a lot of natural barriers to prevent movement of deer. Uh, their nearest positives that are known at this point in time are still, you know, quite a ways away from our border in that area. Um, but they have just recently changed some regulations in their surveillance program. So um, I'd say stay tuned on that one. But, you know, that this is why we put the movement restrictions in place uh, for carcass movements and things like that. Um, our, we don't talk much about it, but on our ag counterpart side of things, there's our movements of live deer that there's restrictions in place for to prevent movement on that, the, the disease on that side of things too. Um, you know, that's why we just advise people to be cautious about moving things in. You know, it is kind of hard to uh, stop natural movement of deer across the landscape. Um, you know, so we, we pretty much we have to focus on the things that we can control on the human side of things. So. All right. Well, guys, it's we've been going about an hour strong here. Do you want to uh, anything else you want to add before we close it out tonight? Yeah, I'd like to say uh, a few more things. As, as we've presented and, and described the, the work that's been done and what we've learned, we've, we've mentioned a few important partners that, that have helped us uh, along the way. And I, the, the ones that haven't been mentioned that I wanted to point out was the 
Tennessee Wildlife Federation, you know, through Hunters for the Hungry, that's been a, a good partnership. And, and that's, um, that's very um, relevant uh, to our targeted removal efforts and the, the um, venison donations from that program. So I wanted to mention them and, and USDA Wildlife Services also a partner with uh, with targeted removal and the and the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Foundation, we also have a strong partnership with agriculture, with the Department of Agriculture and the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, and uh, the processors and taxidermists in Unit CWD. They've been a crucial part, and the the aerial uh, estimates that we've done in partnership with with aerial infrared resources and then and then obviously our partnership with the University of Tennessee. But a lot of a lot of the the visuals that we've shared tonight also have come from uh, specialists within TWRA that that rarely get mentioned um, because time is limited. So I wanted to point out the folks that do our disease reporting work, you know, they inform a lot of a lot of what we've presented with to you tonight, as well as the GIS staff, GIS staff and the team of, of, uh, of biologists and, and managers and such that are focused on contact, contacting the hunters and finding out exactly where these positive deer are harvested. So special thanks to those partners and, and to those different groups within TWRA. Thanks for your support. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks for, for bringing those guys up and mentioning that. Um, it's a team effort. A lot of work goes into this, and uh, I've appreciated the information y'all brought us tonight. It's been great. I know uh, we've got quite a few thank yous on on the comments, and they appreciate uh, the folks out there watching appreciate this information. So we need to do this uh, do this again. We'll bring this uh, bring another update update to you soon. And I guess if that's it, we'll call it night. How's that sound? I'd say that's good. I, I wanted to give Dan one more opportunity since uh, it, it sounds better when he's when he's not in presentation mode. <laughs> Dan, Dr. Grove, excuse me, was it was there anything burning that he, that you wanted to share that uh, it was you weren't able to earlier? If not, we can we can move forward. But just wanted to give you that one last opening. I, I honestly I don't know what you heard and what you didn't hear, so I don't know what what, <laughs> what I might need to repeat. Um, you know, the you heard it all. You just sounded a bit like R2D2. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You don't need, you don't need to repeat any of it. I mean, if there was anything further, uh, when, when we interrupted you there at the end, if there was anything that further that you'd like to share. No, no, I think, I think we hit the high point that our prevalences in some areas are increasing. Uh, some areas, you know, we didn't have a new detection this year in Chester County. Uh, you know, but again, just, I always like to reiterate to folks that, you know, we're 26, 27 months in now at this point in time, we're, we need to, you know, four or five years from now, we're going to have a lot more information and, and a better idea of what's going on. Um, things will change from year to year, but the big picture type stuff, we won't really know for another couple of years yet. So just stay tuned. All right. Well, uh, once again, thank you guys. Uh, and thanks everyone for for watching tonight. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Uh, real quick, I'll mention cwdintennessee.com. That's where you can find uh, a lot of information and uh, the details for all the things we've talked about tonight. Uh, and um, if that's it, I will let everybody go. Y'all have a good evening. Thanks for joining. Thanks,